Income tax 2023-2024 payments. Get ready and some coffee because we're setting our refunds to the max with income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in the form 1040 instructions tax year 2023 section tax and credits, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused down here on the line for tax payments that includes the withholding the estimated tax payments and so on and so forth remembering though that the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions getting us to the taxable income the taxable income therefore basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula, but it's not the whole story. It's basically only half the story because we still have the second half of the income tax formula. Once we get to that bottom line, which we can often mirror and double check with an external worksheet, such as our Excel worksheet formula, we calculate the tax on it, which as we saw in a prior presentation is not that easy because we don't just have one flat tax rate, but rather a progressive tax system and therefore are often dependent on the software to do this bit, which is easy if you have software to do it, but not transparent because you're not really looking at the detail, the software actually doing some fairly complex calculations, even if it's a simple progressive tax system and often more complex calculations because certain incomes are not gonna be subject to ordinary income, but rather subject to possibly more favorable incomes, such as the uh, qualified dividends possibly and the long-term capital gains. So that's gonna get us to our tax before credits and other taxes. Then we've got the uh, tax credit and other taxes, one of the main other taxes we've looked at, Social Security and Medicare in the format of self-employment tax. And then we have credits, which we'll talk about in future presentations, which complicate things in that they're good or similar to deductions because we like that they're going to be favorable for taxes. But if we had a dollar credit and a dollar deduction, the credits would generally be more favorable because they would get that full dollar worth of benefit, which we'll talk more about later. That gets us to our total tax. Still not done at this point because it's not like we just wait until the end of the year and then we calculate our taxes and we figure out what we owe and just pay it all at that point in time. We're not sitting here at April 15th figuring our taxes and then just paying the entire bill for the entire prior year. That's not what the IRS wants us to do. They won't let us do that, but instead the IRS wants us paying the taxes throughout the year and then the to report the, the 1040 after or by April 15th of the following year. And hopefully we paid a little bit more of the taxes that are owed so we can get a refund. Now note, in a perfect world, what we would have is something similar to what we see in payroll taxes, which you might be familiar with, with reporting a 941 form, which is usually just an informational form. In other words, we paid the exact amount of tax as payroll is processed, 
And then we file the, the form on a quarterly basis, just reporting what has already been done, nothing being owed, nothing being refunded at that point in time. The individual income tax form 1040 is designed the same way. We're supposed to pay as we go. The form 1040 should just be a reporting form, not requiring a refund or payment. But it's too complex for that. The tax code is too complex. We cannot possibly pay the proper amount of taxes. It's impossible because of the complexity of the tax code. Therefore, what do we have to do? We have to overpay. Why do we have to overpay and not underpay? Because the IRS wants to make sure that we pay. And if we underpay, they hit us with the sticks, metaphorically, of penalties and interest. Therefore, all of the withholdings, the tax tables, our estimated tax payments are typically designed to overpay, not because we want the cool refund at the tax time, but because we're trying to avoid the penalties and interest and overpaying gives us a little bit of safeguard to make sure that we do that typically. So that's what's happening here. And that's what we're looking at now. Now, usually this is going to be in the form of withholdings for W-2 withholdings. But if you're not a W-2 employee, it gets more complex because then you're going to have to make your own estimated tax payments if you're a sole proprietor. And if you're retired, oftentimes retirees run into tax problems because they've never really had to, to think too much about the, the, their estimated tax payments because it's been done automatically by just filling out their their w4 and when they pull money out of a retirement account which is now subject to taxes because of the rules related to a 401k and whatnot they often have to think more deeply about tax planning in retirement which they've never really had to do during their working life right that's that's what these are kind of like the downsides of making things too automatic we're basically the laws are nudging us to do certain things which the law thinks are good but which don't require us to actually make our own decisions and think about what we're doing because then we don't know why we're doing it, right? We're just doing things because that's what we've been nudged to do or they forced us to do it or whatever. In any case, that's going to give us our tax refund or tax due. All right, so this is the second page of the Form 1040. We're looking at this payments section. So the payments represent payments that we're making. These are our payments to the government typically made in the form of withholdings. For most people, that's gonna be the W-2 withholdings if you're in your working years. You might've had withholdings on like a 1099 though. That would typically be the case if you're in retirement because then you're gonna get 1099 R's from like retirement accounts like a 401k or IRAs. And you could retire, you could withhold from those amounts or you might get 1099s from interest, dividends, or possibly from uh, miscellaneous or non-employee compensation, where you could have withholdings there as well, but you typically don't. You're mostly going to see it uh, if you have withholdings on a 1099 in a 1099R. However, if someone is in retirement, oftentimes they might just make their own estimated tax payments. That's another way that you can kind of think so about how you're going to do the withholdings. Whereas if you're a W-2 employee, you're basically kind of required to do uh, the withholdings because the employer is basically forced to do that in essence. And then you have other forms that could have withholdings. So you might have like a, a gambling winnings or something that has withholdings in it or something that you could have another form. We're gonna add those up. And then we have the estimated tax payments. So the other ways that you could might you might make payments is by estimated tax payments, which most commonly is done if you have a Schedule C uh, because then you're gonna, then you have no one to withhold in your earning years, or possibly if you're in retirement, then you might be making estimated tax payments as opposed to withholding from like a 1099R. Okay, so let's look at the payments. Line 25, federal income tax withheld. Line 25A forms W-2. So add the amounts shown as federal income tax withheld on your form W-2. Enter the total on line 25A. The amount withheld should be shown in box two of form W-2. Attach your forms W-2 to, to your return. Now, normally we're going to be filing electronically. 
if we have people that are employees, if we were an employee as a taxpayer, then we will, of course, receive the W-2, the main information impact in the Form 1040 that is on the W-2 is typically going to be the income, which is box one. That's income subject to federal income taxes, as opposed to three and five boxes, which are income subject to Social Security and Medicare. Notice that Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes uh, have been paid exactly what we owe. So that's being reported to the IRS as well as us with the W-2 by the employer. But we typically don't have to do anything with the Social Security and Medicare because it's more of a flat tax. It's not so complex. And therefore, they accurately took the money out and paid exactly what we owe. And the IRS just has an informational form of the W-2 about those two. With the federal income taxes, however, then that's going to be box two showing what was withheld from us. That is going to be vitally important on the Form 1040 because the Form 1040 is focused mainly on the federal income taxes. So the income is going to be on the first page of the Form 1040. And on the second page of the 1040, we have the amount that we have withheld. Now, if the W-2 income was the only income we had for the taxpayer, then again, you would, you would think it would just be an informational return. Here's how much I earned. Here's the taxes that I calculated based on how much I earned. And here's what I already paid you because my employer took it out of my wages. In a perfect world, those would be equal. Nothing due, nothing refunded. It's not a perfect world. Tax code's too complex. Therefore, the federal withholding tables are designed to overwithhold. Therefore, if you properly fill out the W-2, you're typically going to end up with a calculation of a refund, the point being of a refund to avoid the penalties and interest. Possibly if you're cynical, the point being of a refund, if you're the IRS, is to make you think the IRS is the good guy, right? They're the nice ones. Your employer is the jerk that keeps taking your money. And the IRS is the nice one that gives a little bit of it back, even though the employer is, of course, forced to take the money and is giving it to the IRS uh, because they made them. So line 25B forms 1099. So include on line 25B, any federal income tax withheld on forms uh, 1099R. So this would be in retirement. So of course, if people are in their working years, they're not typically going to have a 1099R. They're usually going to have W-2s. They are typically in their working years, possibly putting money into hopefully some kind of retirement plan like a 401k plan or an IRA. And then in their, and that means the money is going to be taken out of box one, right, of their W-2. And you'll see it uh, in, I think, box 10, I think, or 12 or something like that. And then in retirement, they're going to take the money out of the, the IRA or 401k plan, at which point they're taxed on it. Now, again, this often becomes a problem for people that are in their retirement years, because like I say, they haven't really had to think too much about the tax planning because it's been all automated because the IRS forced the employer to do everything their entire life. So if they've been an employee their whole life, they've never really possibly sometimes had to deal with the fact that they're going to have to think about how much they're going to take out and what how much they're going to be able to keep because of the tax situation in terms of how much they take out of the retirement. So if everything is very steady, if it was like a pension plan and they're getting paid the same amount, uh, each year, similar to when they were in their working years, you're probably going to have a situation where you can have withholdings set up and they can be pretty constant. But if they're in, in a plan where they have to choose how much to take out each year, it's not just a, a set amount that's going to be coming out each year, then they usually have to do more tax planning, in which case uh, you might do the withholdings when you take the money out, or you might just try to figure what your total tax would be and and do estimated tax payments or some combination uh, of the two okay so the amount withheld should be shown in box four attach uh, your form 1099 r to the front of your return obviously these days most of the time you're not attaching the forms because you're not doing paper filing but rather filing electronically so if you receive a 2023 form 1099 showing federal income tax withheld on dividends 
taxable or tax-exempt interest, income, unemployment, compensation, social security benefits, railroad retirement benefits, or other income you received, include the amount withheld in the total on line 25B. So this should be shown in box four of form 1099, box six of form SSA 1099, or box 10 of form RRB 1099. Line 25C, other forms. Include on line 25C any federal income tax withheld on your form W2G. So this would be another type of form where we could have uh, withholdings on it, the W2G. The amount withheld should be shown in box four. Attach forms W2G in the front of your return if federal income tax was withheld. Now, oftentimes you might not have uh, tax withheld on that one, but you could and that's where it would go. So if you had additional Medicare tax withheld, include the amount shown on form 8959 line 24 in the total on line 25C, attach form 8959. Include on line 25C any federal income tax withheld that is shown on a Schedule K-1. So where does the Schedule K-1 come from? That's usually gonna be the flow through documentation that you're gonna be getting from like if you had a taxpayer that has an interest in a partnership of some kind or another flow through type of entity such as an uh, S uh, corporation. So usually those are gonna be similar reporting documents to say a W-2 situation or a uh, um, 1099 situation. So when you have a flow through entity, something that's gonna issue a 1099, then the the question as a taxpayer or a preparer side of things is am i involved with the tax preparation for types of entities that need to produce the 1099 in other words am i going to do partnership tax returns as corporation tax returns or am i going to say i'm not going to do those returns but i'm willing to take the the uh, k-1s and do the data input from the k-1 into the form uh, 1099 if necessary, right? So that's going to be possibly limiting the type of clients you might take on as a, a tax uh, preparer. So also include on line 25C any tax withheld that is shown on form 1042S, uh, form 8805 or form 8288A. You should attach the form to your return to claim a credit for the withholding. Line 26, 2023 estimated tax payments. So enter any estimated federal income tax payments may, you made for 2023. Include any overpayment that you applied to your 2023 estimated tax from your 2022 return or an amended return. So usually this is going to happen when we have more complex returns. Oftentimes, most commonly, if you have, say, a Schedule C or some kind of uh, business income, because in that case, unlike with a W-2, there is no employer who the IRS can require twist their arm to make them take your money from you before you even receive it. Therefore, they're going to have to twist your arm directly making you actually pay them, write the actual check or send the electronic payment in the form of estimated payments. So they still going to want the payment for tax year 2023 in tax year 2023. That becomes complex for many small businesses because they have no idea how much tax to pay because the tax code is quite complex because we don't have a flat tax system. So you're going to have to estimate. You can't just, for example, say, if I was a new business, new businesses have problems because they don't know how much money they're going to they're going to make in the year. So they could determine, OK, it's been the first quarter. I need to make my estimated tax payments. And I made, you know, five thousand dollars net income in the first quarter. Well, how much tax do I pay? Well, if that's the only income I would have made in the year, I might not have to pay any taxes. Right. I don't know. But what I have to do is annualize that for the taxes for the entire year because of the progressive tax system. So I not only have to figure out my income, my deductions for the quarter, I have to be able to annualize it for the year because that's gonna allow me to put it into the format of the progressive tax system to try to estimate what my tax calculations will be. So that's one problem 
with the sole proprietor. And that's one thing as a tax preparer, you might be able to, you have to do more planning work oftentimes uh, to, to try to get people to do that. People usually, if they're W-2 employees, they haven't had experience really with making their own tax payments. So oftentimes small businesses will get behind in the first year because they didn't pay their first year of taxes and then their cash flow is going to be short because they didn't take that into account. And by the time the year is over, they owe last year's taxes and they owe the current year's taxes, which is going to make a hole that's difficult to, to dig out of, which is what you'd like to avoid uh, beforehand, right? By getting in front of the taxes uh, whenever, whenever possible. The other thing that's confusing about the payments is that the payment for taxes that were made in 2023 might not all be applied to tax year 2023. So in other words, you might have made a payment in 2023, the beginning of 2023, that was a tax payment for the prior year taxes. It was applied to 2022 taxes because it was the fourth quarter payment that was applied to the prior year. So you have this cutoff issue with the tax payments that you want to make sure that you understand the payments that were made, which you can often see in like tax software, like a QuickBooks or something like that, if they're keeping records, but that's not enough because you also have to be able to see, is that payment applied to the current tax year or to the prior tax year? If you had a refund of taxes in 2020, the prior year, 2022, then instead of receiving the refund, Oftentimes, small businesses will say, you keep that money IRS as an estimated tax payment for tax year 2023. So in that situation, you have this first payment that was made that didn't come out of the books for bookkeeping because it was, it was a refund that had been applied. So instead of us receiving the refund and then writing a check back to the IRS where it would hit our bank account, we just told the IRS to, to roll it over. That kind of thing is usually easiest to see in the tax software as you roll over from year to year. In other words, if you use the same tax software, then the prior year refund, refund that was applied to the next year will then roll over and be shown in the following year in the tax software. The thing we have to be careful with that is if the IRS made any adjustments to the taxes because there was an error or something, which sometimes they fix on their side and they send a letter out and they say, if you agree with this adjustment, then, then let us know and we'll make the adjustment or whatever. If that happens and we as the tax preparer don't get that letter, then our estimated tax payments for the first bit will be off or something like that. So these are all kind of little complications that come up usually with like a, a sole proprietor or possibly with someone who is retired and uh, making these estimated tax payments. Usually what happens is if they're making estimated tax payments, we do their calculation in the current year, we figure out what they owe in the current year, if anything, or a refund, and then we do estimated tax payments to figure out what they should be paying next year based on the prior year's information. And that will give us an idea of what we expect them to earn in the following year and also possibly some safe harbor rules so that if they earn more in the following year, maybe they don't owe any taxes because we followed the safe harbor rules to try to avoid the sticks of penalties and interest. And then with at the end of the year, we can kind of shore that up and we can figure out what happened. Also, just note that more and more the IRS is getting better, although they're still far behind businesses with their online tools. So a tax payer or possibly you as a tax professional might help to get onto the actual, their actual IRS website and check out the tax payments. That would be great. Uh, sometimes that's a little complicated to do that. The, like I say, their website isn't as good as a lot of businesses or banking websites or whatnot and being up to date on that kind of stuff and making it easy and to use. But uh, that's a tool that they should be getting better and better at, which should be something that we can check on. Meaning we go onto the website, we log into the, our, our return and we see the estimated tax payments that have been made for uh, the current year so that we can double check that in our tax return. Okay, 
So if you and your spouse pay joint estimated tax but are now filing uh, separate income tax returns, you can divide the amount paid in any way you choose as long as you both agree. If you can't agree, you must divide the payments in a proportion to each spouse's individual tax as shown on your separate returns for 2023. If the, if the spouses can't agree on that kind of thing, then they're probably not the clients that you... That, <laughs> that's probably not a good, good clientele that's going to co cause some headache. But for more information, see publication 505. Be sure to show uh, both the social security number and the space provided on the separate returns. If you or your spouse has paid separate estimated tax, but you are now filing a joint return, add the amounts you each paid, uh, follow these instructions even if your spouse died in 2023 or in 2024 before filing a 2023 return. Divorced taxpayers. So if you got a divorce in 2023 and you made joint estimated tax payments, so now we have this problem, they were married, they were one entity, both in heart, soul, and taxpayer, but then they got divorced in 2023, so now you've got this mingling thing and this mess that's going to happen as you try to unmingle the thing. So if you got divorced in 2023 and you made joint estimated tax payments with your former spouse, enter your former spouse's social security number and the space provided on the front of form 1040 or 1040 SR. If you are divorced and remarried in 2023, that was quick. <laughs> enter your present spouse's social security number in the space provide i'm not judging i'm not ju i'm just saying i just sorry about it the space provided the front of the form 1040 or 1040 sr so also on the dotted line next to line 26 enter your former spouse's social security number followed by div name change if you change your name and you made estimated tax payments using the former uh, name, attach a statement to the front. So obviously this becomes kind of an issue, of course, because it used to be that the IRS actually made it kind of difficult to pay them, which was kind of a problem because, uh, uh, and you would think, well, you know, you're like, I'm trying to pay you, but then it, it, you had to call it in and whatnot. Uh, and then they could apply the payment to the wrong year, in which case they would give you a refund of the payments you made them or something like that. And then they would charge you penalties and interest saying that you didn't pay them. It's like, well, I did pay you. You just assigned it to the wrong year and then you gave it back to me or something like that. So we don't want to confuse the, the IRS is the bottom line, right? They know us as a number, typically a social security number, but that number has to also tie to our legal name or we will confuse the IRS. And if we confuse the IRS, they will not be able to properly allocate the payments we're making to the proper name. And we have to make sure that they apply it to the proper year as well, or else there's gonna be problems. I can't imagine how much problems the IRS is gonna have with these like pronoun things. <laughs> They're gonna be, that's gonna, I don't know, that's gonna cause all kinds of problems. I can already see it in the in the tax in the in the in the publications they make because they're they and yet instead of using precise language like he and she they're using they to represent a singular with a plural you know so that's not very so you can see how you know the, the, this it's gonna it's gonna cause them some confusion i would think so it's kind of funny to watch and somewhat sad but kind of funny at the same time so any case if you change your name and you made estimated tax payments using former name, attach a statement to the front of Form 1040 or 1040 SR that explains all the payments you and your spouse made in 2023 and the names and social security numbers under which you made them.